everybody. Hi, hi, my name is Kevin Chen, and today I'll be talking about a, the video mesh, a new data structure for video editing. So I'll start off with a motivating example. Um, suppose we have this simple input video of my friend here. Uh, we want to be able to control the camera post exposure to achieve effects such as changing the depth of field and interactively moving the focal plane or inserting volumetric smoke that has the right attenuation. So it's like really, really hot coffee. <laughs> we propose a user-driven system that makes effects such as manipulating the depth of field, inserting objects, and changing the viewpoint easier. <laughs> Instead of having dedicated algorithms for each effect, our approach is to construct a data structure that captures the necessary information, such as motion, depth, and texture. We focus on the data structure. The algorithms needed to produce these various effects naturally fall out as operations on this data structure. At a high level, we model the world as cutouts from a sheet of paper like you see on the right. The big difference between the video mesh and previous mesh-based representations is that we model occlusions as they exist in the scene with the proper topology. Uh, before I go on to describe the components of the video mesh, let's look at some related work in representing video. A classical representation used extensively in commercial products is layers. Layers are simple and intuitive, but can only represent simple occlusions. We'd like to be able to support more complex types of, types of occlusions. Uh, uh, my co-author, Joy Wong, who is not the same Wong as in layers, uh, introduced the VideoCube interface in his interactive video cutout system. Uh, he oversegments the video as a preprocess and has a volumetric scribble-based interface for cutting and cut pasting objects in space-time. In contrast, our system doesn't use any preprocessing and lets the user work completely in image space. Uh, more recently, Alex Ravacha and colleagues introduced a very cool concept of an unwrapped mosaic, where they use sophisticated energy minimization to compute an editable texture parameterization of an object from a video. An unwrapped mosaic lets the user edit an object's texture and have it propagate through the sequence. Our method is not nearly as automatic, but runs interactively and can handle more complex geometry. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about data density. There's been extensive work uh, done in estimating dense optical flow and depth maps, but as I'll soon discuss, we, de we decided to encode both optical flow and depth sparsely as vertices in a mesh and instead rely on interpolation. We argue that a sparse, rep represent uh, excuse me, we argue that a sparse representation is much easier to edit than a dense image. So let's go on and review a few of our design goals. First and foremost, our system is for users to edit video. So as I just mentioned, uh, dense optical flow and depth maps are hard to edit. So we're gonna use a sparse representation. We also want a 2D user interface. A video cube is just a little bit too difficult to use. Uh, next, we wanna support the full complexity of real world, world occlusions. So without doing uh, strange things like arbitrarily cutting my arm uh, every time it overlaps my torso. Uh, in the same vein of keeping things editable, we, want, we also wanna use a sparse boundary representation and rely on per pixel alpha to refine them. Finally, we want to keep everything interactive, which means we have to be able to render our representation <coughs> with 3D graphics hardware. Given these cons constraints, our data structure is in the end just a standard mesh, and it looks like the figure on the right. Um, the mesh contains vertices that are feature tracks, which sparsely encodes, uh, encodes both the motion and depth, and has triangular faces which interpolate the data stored at vertices. It's, and it's texture mapped from the input video. The video mesh is a 2.5D representation, so unlike layers where occlusions force objects to be cut into separate pieces, we handle occlusion with overlapping faces. And these faces have an alpha texture which resolves the fine details. However, the video mesh isn't quite a 3D model either. It's structured like sh overlapping sheets of paper which don't form closed surfaces. One important point is that it is manifold connected, which just lets us use a number of standard meshing algorithms. So the rest of the talk is structured as a walk through the user workflow. Um, we'll go through the steps a user would take as he builds up the pieces of the data structure. So starting from an input video, we will first estimate a sparse motion description by tracking some point features, which are then automatically meshed to interpolate the motion across the image plane. Uh, next, we rely on the user to label occlusion boundaries, which are used to locally cut the mesh into layers. These layers are then locally matted into separate texture components. 
Finally, we compute the depth of objects either automatically using structure from motion or using a variety of image-based modeling tools. With a complete video mesh, the user is free to do all, all sorts of manipulations. And although this figure is a pipeline, I want to emphasize that the editing process is iterative and the user can pretty much jump around. So for instance, at any point, he can go back and correct a vertex track because he didn't notice the error until much later. So let's go through the steps in detail. So like I said, the first thing we do is track features. So we use the commercial tracker that's based on corner detection to automatically find and track points. We provide a UI to correct any errors, and the user can also click anywhere to try to track that point. Uh, getting a good density of points is important to ensuring a high quality motion description. One thing to note is that we don't actually assume any long range tracking. So now that we have a sparse description of the motion in the scene, to get motion everywhere, we can compute a Delaunay triangulation over the tracked points in, in, at each frame. This, this is essentially a piecewise linear interpolation of the motion. So let's take a closer look at the motion model. So say we have this triangle at frame T. The, the vertices are our feature tracks and represented as linked lists in time. And in other words, every vertex has a predecessor and a successor. At each frame, we have a standard index list mesh which <coughs> covers the entire image plane. So say we have this point here, it has to lie inside some triangle. So to determine this motion, we simply find its barycentric coordinates in, this, in the current frame, construct the triangle formed by the successors of its vertices in the next frame, and then do barycentric interpolation. Note that with this scheme, the topology does not have to be the same between frames, but if it is, the forward and backward optical flow will match. <coughs> so this is pretty much what it looks like. So, so if you notice, the, motion, the linear motion interpolation actually does a pretty good job where the motion is smooth. Where we run into trouble is at occlusion boundaries. So for, exa for instance, uh, you know, these three points here, we're all tracked correctly. The points on its body <coughs> move with it, and, but the point on, and the point on the background is stationary. The issue is that we can't inter linearly interpolate uh, motion across occlusion boundaries. The way we model occlusions is to cut the mesh like a piece of paper. So what does that mean? It means that we need to separate two components, the geometry and the texture along the boundary. We cut the geometry by duplicating the faces along the boundary, which will then overlap. These faces will have virtual vertices whose motion needs to be estimated. As for texture, we'll locally compute alpha maps. So let's just take a closer look. So this is the standard case. The, uh, there's an inset there. Let's say that the triangles near my, fr my friend's arms uh, spans an occlusion boundary. The user draws an oriented curve that straddles the boundary, and we cut the mesh by well, we duplicate each face that intersects, that the curve intersects into foreground and background copies, creating a set of virtual vertices, the ones that are not filled in. Um, we assign the existing real vertices to the copy of the face which corresponds to the side of the curve they lie on. So virtual vertices are the ones that are on the quote unquote wrong side. Uh, for example, uh, the vertex on the, on the foreground copy, but when on, on the background side of the boundary is virtual. So the real vertices are the ones that have motion information. They each have a successor. But uh, we need to estimate the motion for our new virtual vertices. So we use a pretty basic motion model. So each duplicated triangle has either one or two known motion vectors. So if it has just one, we set the two uh, virtual nodes to have the same translation. And if it's two, we fit a rotation and translation so that it's, it's assumed to move rigidly. Notice that a virtual node can be shared by multiple vertices, uh, uh, multiple, excuse me, multiple triangles. So we just average together all the estimates and create a new successor virtual node. So once we have the right motion, we can use it to advect the splines themselves into other video frames. <coughs> now beyond the standard cut, there are actually a whole bunch of topological cases, such as T-junctions, loops, and cusps, and they all happen in a real video sequence. Um, these cases are actually non-trivial to deal with, and unlike previous work, which tries to remesh re the boundary and ends up with a non-manifold connected mesh, we have a scheme that handles all these cases while remaining manifold connected. Um, manifold connectivity is important because it lets, lets us use standard meshing algorithms for a number of editing operations, such as in-painting when, when we want to move the camera. So to show you just one special case, let's look at a cusp. Yeah, so one example of a cusp is uh, at my friend's arm there, where if you follow the occlusion boundary, it simply stops. Uh, it's like cutting a piece of paper and stopping in the middle. And in our cutting scheme, the mesh will look something like the figure on the right, which is still nice, nicely manifold connected. 
So now that we've cut the geometry, let's look at how we handle texture. For the texture, we use natural image matting to separate the layers. Uh, notice that our splines are thick, which have uh, a black and white border. We rasterize these thick splines to use as a trimap and can feed it to any number of matting backends. Uh, notice that we only locally separate the texture near the boundary and that we, we need multi-layer decomposition at T-junctions. Each time we mat, we locally duplicate the image, which overlaps in space. And we use a tiled storage scheme to efficiently store the texture, and that's discussed in the paper. Okay. Once we did all that work, we can actually now manipulate the video as a paper cutout, as a simple form of depth modeling. So for simple objects, such as our favorite actor, we can simply drag the mouse. So when the user clicks and drags, he sets a depth constraint at a vertex and we solve a Laplace equation for the, over the, for the depth over the domain of the mesh, and the z-values are assigned as temporal keyframes. So I'm just pulling the Coke bottle out. <coughs> for scenes with a static camera, we can use image-based tools to model large-scale objects such as the ground and buildings. For a moving scene where the majority of objects are moving rigidly, we can use structure for motion to compute the camera path and also 3D vertex positions on each object that we've, since we've already cut, cut the geometry. So here's a quick sequence showing image-based modeling. This sequence has a static camera with some pretty complex occlusions between the columns. We, can, we track the points and label just the primary occlusion boundary. So. We can insert a ground plane and model the columns as vertical facades. Once we have depth at the vertices, we can, we can move the camera in the st uh, style of turn to the picture. And because we vertoscope the actor, he actually forms a single connected component uh, in space-time. Uh, we can easily select him and drag him to do copy and paste. In this case, I added a random space and time offset to make the copies not look identical. And notice the pers perspective for shortening uh, as the character is being dragged around. Okay, and since we have 3D information, we can refocus and move the camera. Or, or, or combine the two uh, to create a classic vertical effect. And finally, the scenes, since the scene is fairly diffuse, we can do some cheap relighting by using the input texture itself as the, as the diffuse material. And we add some artificial light sources to make it look like a foggy night. Okay, that was a bit short, so I'll show that again. The depth and the camera path for this scene was computed automatically using structure from motion. We did add some vertices manually by clicking on two points at in different frames and verify that they were stable. The chassis and lid of the copier were cut out and, re and registered together into the same coordinate system. And so now we uh, added a bunch of little characters onto the copier glass and can interactively move the camera. It looks okay if we don't move the camera too far from the original viewpoint, but it does get distorted if we move too far, as you can see here. The input was on the top right. Uh, this sequence has some pretty complex occlusions, especially under the bridge. Uh, the video quickly jumps through the various steps in creating a vid video mesh. We track a bunch of points, cre create a mesh, and cut out the various buildings and the bridge with splines. And we model the geometry with two horizontal planes and vertical walls. And as a result, we can move the camera quite far, and it as it all the way out to the roof of the boat as it sails down the river. So a nice bonus that we get from being able to move the camera is that we can render things in stereo. So I rendered most of our results in RedBlue 3D, so please come see me after the talk for a demo. I have glasses. So a big limitation of our work, which stems from the fact our design decision to use a sparse representation for motion and depth, is its ability to handle complex scenes with high frequency motion or high depth complexity. For example, this field of grass probably has thousands of individual blades randomly waving around, which makes it difficult to represent using a video mesh. Now, one possibility is to compute dense optical flow or depth maps using computer vision and then augment the video mesh with additional texture channels. We also, we will also have trouble representing transparent volumetric phenomena such as this puff of smoke. The other big issue is that building the video mesh can be fairly labor intensive depending on the complexity of the scene. 
we may have to tweak quite a few vertex tracks where automatic tracking may have failed, or adjust a large number of splines where the motion ejection was wrong. So I see better integration with automated tools as the most useful avenue for future research. So to summarize, we presented the video mesh, a data structure that models the world as paper cutouts whose topology reflects that of the underlying scene. I've highlighted a, n a number of our design decisions in making of a sparse, editable representation and showed how once we have the video mesh, we can achieve a number of special effects, such as, uh, and these are done as just simple man manipulations of the data structure. So thank you, and I'll take any questions. I mean, so I mean, the like, it, those were just pretty much stationary. I was it was just there because uh, I just randomly clicked a bunch of points. <laughs> I j just want to get a relatively uh, good triangulation. So those points didn't move. Then? Those points just didn't move. Yeah. Uh, so that was done using a st structure for motion. So I mean, it, I, I used Buju, so it, it computed a whole bunch of points. And then once we have the camera path, we can just click on the same point in two frames. It'll <coughs> triangulate to, to compute the 3D points. Probably, yes. Yeah. So the, we use the match mover. It, 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 there's an automatic mode which computes a whole bunch of points, but it's generally not quite dense enough. So you, you can ask for more, but the quality of the, tr the motion is low, so it's a bit of a trade off between density and sensitivity, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's no reason for it to, for it to I mean, we can use any, like, uh, we, can, we can support any feature tracker. <laughs> 